Greetings, ladies and men, gents, and welcome to this latest narration of the web series Wearing Power Armor to a Magic School. If you are new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below in the description. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 31 Now that's a lot of damage. We both spent the next few seconds staring intently at the only victim of the collateral damage from that very brief and very one sided exchange. An exchange which involved 25 very fast boys and one very well-protected, handcrafted suit of enchanted armor. A suit of armor, who was an innocent victim in all of this, whose only offense was simply being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was an offense that led to a hailstorm of bullets, creating an unsightly hole where a beefy neck guard had once been. This surprising turn of events had resulted in a very perplexed Sokar, who seemed to be unable to make heads or tails of all of this. The man's gaze remained completely transfixed on what could only be described as a clean textbook example of a shot grouping made possible by a tried and proved weapon with centuries of refinement under its belt. The thumb-sized hole that had manifested on a particularly heavy reinforced part of the armor looked almost surreal given the otherwise immaculate state of the suit. It looked almost intentional, almost mockingly so, and would have more than likely been immediately attributed to a great many forms of manner fueled shenanigans, rather than an unassuming mannerless prick that was my pistol. After a few more moments of silence, punctuated only by an awkward shuffle as the man knelt down to get a closer look at the damage, he eventually turned his face to me again with a clenched fist and a single thumb pointing towards the hole in question. So, uh, mannerless, he asked with a genuine display of disbelief as if needing to hear me say it one last time to douse what few embers remained in his lingering skepticism. A skepticism which I only had one response for, that being a confident nod with a sheepish smile. Yeah, mannerless. A sharp sigh soon followed, as the armorer wiggled his hand in place for a few seconds, causing two back-to-back -back upticks in mana radiation. Alert. Localized surge of mana radiation detected. 200% above background radiation levels. The lights in the room suddenly dimmed. Alert, localized surge of mana radiation detected, 230% above background radiation levels. And an object suddenly appeared in the armor's formerly empty hands. An object which bore a remarkable similarity to a flashlight. If you were to replace the butt of it with a dull, pulsating orb of light encased in a spinning disk of crystals, it looked like something you'd find in an endgame dungeon despite its sole purpose being identical to that of your common requisitions office grade flashlight. The purpose of this device and the sudden dimming of the workshop's lights was soon made clear to me as he pointed the light through the hole in the armor, only for it to emerge on the other side seamlessly. Because you've left me with not one hole to worry about, but two, and as a result left me with double the questions, double the perplexity, and double the mystery, as to how a mannerless projectile was able to make it through enchanted armor, not just once, but twice. So Khan reinforced the sheer and utter disbelief by rapidly flicking the bottom of the magical flashlight with his fingers, causing the light to turn on and off in rapid succession. A very apt metaphor for how he was currently feeling at this point, no doubt. The armor, uh, despite being enchanted, is just steel, correct? I responded with a straightforward question. Mana steel, yes, but I assume your point still stands, the armorer responded curtly. And I'm assuming there is no additional funny business involved, no enchantments that can repel projectiles, no shields that slow down incoming blows, or anything like that, I continued further. Not this particular armorer, no. It's just commissioned from the same person who commissioned the pull arm. All he wanted, and all he was allowed, was a series of complex enchantments designed to strengthen the mana steel, resilience, durability, and other such assorted enchantments, the armorer listed off in rapid succession. With it being confirmed that all I was dealing with was just a super strengthened piece of metal, I was confident in leading into my final point. Well, theoretically speaking, even with enchantments, anything with enough mass, traveling with enough speed, could pierce an object, correct? The armorer made a point to cock his head to the other side, and if he still had eyes, I bet they'd be staring at me with all sorts of emotions right about now. The speeds an object would need to achieve to pierce the enchanted armor, not once but twice, would be impossible to accomplish without the aid of direct manipulation of mana, or a construction of an artifice using mana, the armor stated plainly, with a hint of disbelief coloring his voice. 
No, no mannerless mechanism would be able to accomplish a similar end. This is not to mention that the object in question would have to be shaped with the explicit purpose to pierce mana steel. And would have to be forged out of a material with properties comparable to mana steel, if not exceeding it. The man paused after the spiel for a few seconds, his whole body going completely still as he began mumbling to himself. A smart smith would have to weigh the cost and benefit of the velocity versus the weight of the projectile, and the energy capable of being transferred at the point of impact. Moreover, different shapes designed to be a certain armors and the properties of the metals involved would also come into play, which, given the back-and-forth nature of arms and defense, all of this would imply, he mumbled stop as he rapidly cocked his head towards the hole yet again, then towards me. Just how far has your realm come, where your people have found it necessary to develop projectiles capable of piercing materials comparable to enchanted mana steel, Emma Booker? The armorer spoke with nothing but a shock and disbelief in his voice. Far enough, I spoke vaguely, as I knew I had to tread the line between discretion and answers like a thread through a needle. The armorer let out a sharp humph at my answer before continuing. I shouldn't be surprised, though. I should have expected as much, given how that small weapon of yours was capable of containing a chain of consecutive explosions. The armorer spoke in no uncertain terms, as I felt my heart practically skipping a beat. That's what it was, wasn't it? At that dreadful sound, I've traveled in my fair share of explosive weaponry. I know the sound and contained explosive when I hear one. I paused, trying to wrap my head around the acceptable answer as I landed on a plausible, middling response. I'm only to be cut off by an armor before I could go anywhere with that. Actually, don't answer that question, he urged sharply as he craned his head towards several aspects in the room before landing on an entryway to the workshop. It was the same tone that he'd used when he'd hurriedly approved my weapon and permanently ended the weapon's inspection, right before Illinois' prank. It was that same, almost hushed sort of self-conscious intonation that felt just a bit off from the endlessly curious tone he usually spoke in. It would be rude of me to intrude, but to blindly ask for something that might well be a trade secret of another smithy or armory after all, he quickly added, clearly attempting to justify that abrupt halt in his curious train of thought by giving me an answer that was just convincing enough, but still left me with a certain sense of unease. Another awkward silence soon descended on us. Something was clearly going through Sokoa's head, something that the man clearly didn't want to say or mention out loud. The way he stood there, just glancing back and forth between me and the whole ridden suit of armor, made me think that there was more to the sudden stop in the flow of the conversation, and more to the abrupt cutoff of his naturally curious tendencies. Don't interpret this the wrong way, Emma Booker, he suddenly spoke up. I want nothing more than to dive deeper into the inner workings of such a fascinating weapon. However, I believe it's best if certain things were left unspoken. I wouldn't want to rescind my earlier approval of that weapon after all. The man spoke with a wink, or what could be interpreted as a wink as he tilted his helmet back and forth enough to generate that same effect. That one statement alone was evidence enough to prove to me that the armorer was actively trying to help. There were a thousand and one ways he that could have played out, and a hundred thousand more scenarios where he could have just taken the pistol away. Yet this was one of those outcomes where that wasn't the case. Perhaps the hearts and minds aspect of this whole mission was already starting to pay off. Either way, I believe it's about time you took your leave, Emma Booker. I said it before, but I'll say it again. I've taken enough of your time as it is. So Khan spoke with a grandfatherly warmth. And unlike myself, I know there's a fleshy body inside of that armor that needs to sleep. I didn't feel right just to leave it at that. I felt like I had to clear this air somewhat, especially with how things panned out. And especially after all the acts of goodwill Sokar had risked his own skin just to put forward. Listen, Sokar, I'm sorry about how things turned out tonight. Oh, whatever do you mean by that, Emma Booker? The man spoke with his signature head tilt. The way he spoke was completely devoid of any duplicity or sarcasm, but instead a genuine sense of confusion. It's just, well, first of all, I'm sorry for this entire mess. I gestured at the room, though, to be fair, the mess was referred to as almost completely gone now, as whatever magic was responsible for cleaning everything up had made short work of the disaster Eleanor had left behind. First off, none of this was your mess to begin with, Emma Booker, the armorer replied with absolutely no hesitation. And second, it's a relatively trivial matter for a caster of my caliber to deal with. 
As you'll see, he gestured towards the scanned few objects that were slowly making their way back to their rightful places. The workshop practically is as good as new now. Well, I most certainly can't argue with that, I responded with a sigh. But I still feel somewhat responsible for the damage. I gestured towards the whole ridden suit of the armor in question. If I hadn't used my weapon on that fake creature, then you can't feel mana fields underneath all that mana-resistant metal, can you, Emma Booker? The armorer interjected with the question. No, not really. At least not as I understand how most Nexians can. Well, then you're at no fault, the armorer stated in no uncertain terms. The projection you saw was as uh, accurate as could be, down to the finest physical details, and he even took up physical space. However, it was just a mana field that gave it away. It wasn't that it was undetectable, but rather it was a rough approximation of what was simply incongruent with the creature that was purporting to be. Given what you have told me, that you are from a realm without mana, belonging to a species without a mana field, it would have been all but impossible for you to have distinguished that beastly projection from its real counterpart. Come to think of it, even the peasant with that ability to detect mana wouldn't be able to detect the finer details of its falsehood as the field of projector was there, but just not right. If that's the case, then that might explain why the senses were fooled. It wasn't that it was a hologram, it was an actual, physical thing. Which again brings up the uncomfortable question of just how Eleanor was able to capture the Null's likeness down to a T. The ability to feel and see mana field sounds almost like an extra sense, I pondered out loud. That it is, Emma Booker. Or rather, it's a sense that is found in all living things in the Nexus and the adjacent realms. I wouldn't want to sound presumptuous, but considering that you are unable to sense that at all, you technically are the exception to the rule. Apologies if that was in any way offensive, the armor responded sheepishly. No offense taken, Sakar. I promptly dismissed the man's concerns and reassured him with a firm nod. There was a lot to unpack and uncover here, and a heck of a lot more things to learn. But for now, I needed to wrap things up. There would be time to delve deeper into the finer details of mana, into whatever Sorka seemed to have a paranoid of, and into Illinois' conspiracy. Probably not in that order, but still. There would be a time and a place for them. For now, the primary concern was to finally bring this question line to an end, before shifting my entire focus back on resuming the hunt for the crate. I'm not too great at goodbye, so uh, I guess this is it. At least until we inevitably bumped into each other again. I do have a whole year to spend here, after all. I spoke under exasperated breath. Indeed, and several more years following that to boot. So no frets, young cadet, for we will soon cross paths yet again. I just know it, Sokar replied cheerfully. Oh, and before I forget, the man outstretched her hand towards the general direction of the damaged suit of armor. Alert, localized surge of mana radiation detected. 270% above background radiation levels and telekinetically pulled out what seemed to be a collection of bits of metal deep within the stone wall behind it. Here are your projectiles back, he spoke giddily as he clinked the bits and pieces of metal around in his glove. Such fascinating specimens, before reluctantly pouring all of them back onto my waiting hand. Please send my regards to Dr. Allison Cooper and Dr. Richard Lee for the invention and the refinement of such a novel constructs. Another sharp shiver ran down my spine as the armorer spoke of two long-dead engineers, clearly working off the assumptions from my purposefully vague explanation of the gun from earlier. I'll see what I can do about that. The pair are, um, normally quite preoccupied. Dr. Cooper, Dr. Lee, please don't haunt my dreams for this. I did what I had to, I whispered internally to myself, and to the long-departed spirits of the two world-renowned engineers who were more than likely now waiting for me with rolled-up newspapers for when it was my turn to join them in the afterlife. And thank you for returning these, I said as I pocketed the bullets, or what was left of them, back into one of my many pouches. It was at that point Sir Carr began ushering me towards the double doors, but continued talking as he accompanied me out. You're more than welcome to return to the workshop at any point, Emma Booker. However, there are a few caveats you must be aware of. As you might have overheard from our confrontation with the Venurian, the workshop is generally off-limits to students. This means that you would normally have to get through the faculty to request an audience with me. However, I would request that you actively avoid the conventional channels should you wish to return. You can instead approach the workshop directly, though you must first inform one of my many golems that line the hallways first. They will inform me of your presence, and we can proceed from there. 
The man paused, placing a hand on my shoulder just as we reached the double jaws. Make sure that you address the golems and not the gargoyles, he air quickly added. We'll do so, Carl, I added cautiously, and soon after left the workshop in an almost the same way I entered, without much fanfare and with dread looming ahead of me. However, as I turned back towards the doors one final time, waving the man yet another goodbye, that sense of dread lifted somewhat. My time with Sukkot was exposed by revelation far more vital than the intel I'd managed to gather on the offensive capabilities and the industrial potential of the Nexus. It exposed something that should have been obvious from the beginning, but that I now had more evidence for. It demonstrated the fact that the Academy, and perhaps by extension the Nexus, wasn't just a monolithic faceless threat. Because, as with any institution, it was composed of people, and people tended to vary wildly in possibly every possible metric as evidenced by Sukkot himself. I'd arrived at the workshop believing that I was in for an uphill battle, believing that the armorer would be yet another Nexus show. Yet the man I encountered was anything but. As I was instead faced with a near-broken man, who perhaps suffered just as much as any under the system he served. My interactions with Sukkot were forced me to rethink my current presumptions over the Academy. It gave me some hope that there was good here, underneath what would otherwise be a gilded world in name alone. Dragon's Heart Tower, Level 23, Residence 30, Living Room, Local Time, 0300 Hours, Emma Booker They say that you don't really notice how tired you are until you finally reach the finish line. Well, whoever they are, they are right. I wanted nothing more than to drop dead. I desired sleep. I craved rest. My body screamed at me just to lie where I stood as I entered through the double doors and back into the sanctuary that was the dorm. Yet rest would not come for me that easy. Indeed, I knew that my night had only just begun, at least when it came to the long laundry list that came up with the setup of the tent. Looking at the top right-hand corner of the HUD, I physically shuddered when I saw the looming horror that came second only to the null with the level of primal dread it instilled within me. It was a feeling that was well known within the ranks of anyone trained in expeditionary warfare, a sense of inevitability that would have made even the most hardened of veterans quake in their boots. All this was an enemy that you couldn't just dispatch with, at least not with a bullet, a laser beam, or a bolt of plasma. It was an enemy that you could only deal with using a squad of auto-assembly drones and a lot of troubleshooting. It was the dreaded checklist. In front of my eyes, superimposed in front of the dark and silent room, like a specter of a freshly minted sapper, was the monster of a checklist that grew larger and larger in size the longer my pupils remained fixated on it. Ongoing task, tent. Basic setup, 72%. Intermediate setup, 34%. Advanced setup, 23%. Setup of internal facilities, NA. Setup of external perimeter equipment, 10%. Eventually, the next came to dominate the majority of my vision, not out of some quirk of the interface, but because it was necessary for what was to come. Menu expansion? Yes, no. Because within those categories was nestled a collapsible menu that held an endless stream of subcategories, and within those there were individual tasks arranged in order of priority, color-coded with its prerequisite equipment and materials, and further marred with a series of a hundred different bits and pieces that were by themselves fine but when put together looked like an info logger I had thrown up on my HUD. Because an expeditionary warfare, the only ones responsible for your bed, your shower, your facilities, is you. I began recalling some of my aunt's many warnings about heading voluntarily into expeditionary training and certification. That's why I joined the TSEC proper. All you need to worry about is your kit, your weapons and insertion, and killing anything outlined in red. Everything else is not my problem. You join the LREF if you want to spend half your time training how to prepare for the hypothetical alien war on a hypothetical alien world by a not hypothetical assembly basis from the ground up over and over again. Join the army if you want to roll the dice on whether or not you plan on doing the same thing that the LREF does, just with less prestige, or end up being stuck on base for the entirety of your service. If only she could see what I'd got myself into. I sighed and began looking around for any signs of life. All I could see, however, was a room with only the crackling fireplace as its sole source of light. It was quiet, somewhat eerie, but very peaceful. I kind of liked it. 
Some peace after a day of non-stop action was nice. At least, that's what I thought, until I heard the telltale signs of life from within Thalman and Ulanor's room. A series of loud thumps grew in rapid succession. As if someone was purposely stopping at either the floors or even the walls, given how erratic things sounded from this side of the wall. I knew it wasn't my business to involve myself in other people's business, but heck, I couldn't help myself. So I took a few tentative steps towards the room, which was more than enough for me to hear bits and pieces of vitriolic arguments brewing within. I'm not going to ask again. Where the heck are you, Lizard? I heard a very distinct voice growl out. Elman's voice let out. As the EV began filtering the audio, amplifying, then assigning names to the voices for good measures. Where I was was none of your concern, Lupinar. I find your obsessive interest over my actions to be quite telling, mercenary prince. You don't seem to have much in the way of your own business to attend to now, do you? Perhaps you find it more engaging to live vicariously through another's eyes. Is that what it is? The small thing was just as smarmy as ever. You know damn well that's not what this is about. Now stop skirting my questions. You expect to arrive back here, enter our room, even without him giving me the most common courtesy of explaining why you left in the first place. Is that how manners go in your kingdom? I'll be having none of this. Not tonight. Not wait. Just a moment. Alert. Localized surge of manner radiation detected. 225% above background radiation levels. Any and all sounds from within the room suddenly stopped after that burst of manner. I could only assume that the lizard had more than likely pulled up another privacy barrier. Good luck, Thalman. You're going to need it, I whispered silently into my helmet as I left the wolf to his fate and silently trudged back to my room. I'd done everything in my power to delay the inevitable. Now it was time to face the music. Opening the door to the room, I was met with silence. Not the dull droning of the generators, nor the vacuum-like whirring of the emred, but just silence. Taking more tentative steps towards the tent, it soon became clear just why things were this silent. Alert, localized surge of manor radiation detected 275% above background radiation levels. Thassia, I clearly accounted for the noise, I decided to preemptively deal with it, before I even got back. My suspicions were confirmed as I looked up towards the second floor lofts and noticed that one of the beds was already occupied. Thank you, Thassia. You really are a lifesaver. I thought to myself with a smile. As I prodded my way over to what looked to be a massive food cart just randomly placed in the corner of the room, it was only when I got close that I realized what it was. And it was only that the huge pang of hunger finally hit me. It was the to-go order I requested earlier this morning at breakfast. I completely forgot about it with everything else that had happened over the course of the day. From the spy drone to the revelation of Null, to the library and the subsequent fight that ensued in the gardens, to the discussions of the gun to both Sassia and Thelman, and then the whole night spent in the armorer's workshop, the food cart had been all but been ejected from my mind. Looking at the massive cart, I noticed a small letter written in handwriting that looked as if it had come straight from the table of a master calligrapher. The Evie and the translation suites made quick work of the text as I began reading it. Emma, you'll find that the food is still in the same condition as it was this morning, as the Academy utilizes a spell to ensure the freshness of the dishes. Please find the time to eat something. Your lack of appetite is starting to worry me. With sincerest regards, Thassia D. I couldn't double feel a certain pang of something at the end of that letter. I couldn't quite place it, but it felt nice. Though as I stared at the still fresh fruit, I quickly realized that it could only help me so much. Given that I'd forgotten to put it in the emred earlier in the day, and since the machine hadn't yet been tested and needed several samples to calibrate, I knew I wouldn't be seeing any of these dishes inside the tent. At least until sometime tomorrow. With that being said, I needed to put something in there now if I wanted to see results. So I took a few sample foods that were of similar densities. That being some bread and what looked like pancakes and tossed those into the Emred's external facing compartment. With that out of the way, I turned to the rest of the equipment still tucked away in the crates. I stared at them for a solid few minutes, my fingers gliding over my tablet as I finally landed on something that satisfied both the checklist and my own selfish desires. It was going to be a long shot, but I knew that I could do it. This would be something that I would need if I was going to stand any chance of resuming my quest to retrieve the crate. Starting with an unscheduled visit to a hopefully lucid apprentice. Start setup, hygiene module, yes, no. 
I was going to take a warm shower tonight. It was the last thing I do. End of chapter. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Bushmaster 177, Henry the Red, Caspar Arnholtz, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Elijah Silvercross, Dragzoon WRE, and Severin Cerberus. Thank you very much.